length of the Senate District of Wisconsin, which encompasses the 25th, 6th, and 7th uh, Assembly Districts. Um, the uh, incumbent is uh, Devin Lemieux. Uh, he's a Republican. And the challenger is uh, Kyle Welton, or Welton. And he is a Democrat, and he is challenging. Uh, I did put a map on your uh, table so you can kind of see where the 9th District uh, is. And it's basically most of Sheboygan County at least the eastern part, most of uh, Manorwalk County in the southern part, and a little bit in the middle of Calumet County. So with that, I think I'll uh, flip a coin to see who wants to go first. I'll let the cha challenger uh, call it. having me here. Thank you, Scott, for arranging this. Um, I think I can all say that we're grateful there's only 15 days left until we can watch a Packer game without any political ads. Um, and I uh, want to take a moment and congratulate the Rotary Club on the citation award that was given to North and South Interact. And certainly uh, an incredible achievement for the students, but we all know that that doesn't happen without dedicated advisors and community members, and that's, that's where you all come in. So I was born and raised here in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, just one of four kids. And growing up, my family fell on some hard times. After my parents split, my mom had to work three jobs for a couple of years just to pay the bills. And that's what's inspired my life in service. Uh, it's an experience that never left me and it informed an understanding in me at a very young age that no parent should ever have to work multiple jobs just to support their family. And so I've gotten involved to fight to make sure that no parent ever has to make that same sacrifice. I serve as a school board member here in Sheboygan because I believe that education is a great equalizer. It provides every child, regardless of their parents' income and ability, a shot at the middle class and the quality uh, education. I serve as president of Habitat for Humanity Lakeside, building homes for families in need because I believe that every child deserves a decent place to live. And I spent a year fighting the opioid epidemic with the Wisconsin Recovery Community Organization because we're not doing enough to battle addiction and, and combat this. It's tearing our families apart. But what I can tell you is frustrating for me is that the more that I've gotten involved, the more people that I meet, the more that I go out through the community, the more I find folks still struggling like my mother did. More parents who are working second and third jobs. More young people overburdened with student debt, wondering when they'll finally make enough to have a middle class life like their parents did. And more seniors and families that are struggling to afford the cost of their health care and their prescription drugs, and that's why I'm running for state senate. See, it doesn't seem hard for me to understand how we got to this point, because when you look at the United Way's Alice report, over one third of households in Wisconsin right now are struggling to make ends meet, by pay for things like rent and food and um, utilities. And when you look at it, we're dead last in new business startup activity, we're dead last in entrepreneurism, the median wage adjusted for inflation is lower than it was eight years ago, and 45% of Wisconsinites believe that their public schools are worse than they were just a few years ago. We're in this spot because Wisconsin hasn't invested in the structures that allow communities to grow, families to thrive, and businesses to develop. If we want this to happen, we've got to make sure that we're investing the resources to make it possible. A culture of entrepreneurship and innovation starts with a world-class education. We've got to make sure that our public schools are fully funded that we're recruiting and retaining the best teachers, and that this is a state where young people want to live. We're the 10th most moved from state in the union. Part of it's because we haven't invested in transportation. As I said, we've got the fourth worst roads in the country. Wheel taxes have gone up 300% in the last eight years. When you're a person who's coming out of college and looking where you want to invest, you want to invest in a community that knows it's gonna continually raise your local taxes and you're gonna pay an extra $637 a year in road maintenance, 
because the state hasn't done their job in funding our roads? Our bonding rate and transportation is 22% in this latest budget. There's nothing fiscally responsible about dedicating 22% of our income in transportation to paying debt service instead of fixing the roads. We've kicked the can down the road far too long. I'm running in this race because I want to put progress over politics, community before party, and families first. I'm dedicated to making sure that we're coming together as a community and solving these problems just as you are as Rotarians. Service above self. As a Marquette graduate, and Caitlin, I highly <coughs> encourage you to, to pursue that education, um, it was instilled in me that your life should be dedicated to service, men and women for and with others. And the way that we move Wisconsin forward, that we tackle these challenges, that we create opportunities for entrepreneurs in the state, it's through that, that culture of service. It's not through playing political games and taking direction from party leaders. And so with that, I'll close, keep it brief, and turn over, and then we can move to, to question and answers. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to see you got the uh, dress code for the yeah, event today. Uh, <laughs> Ce celebrating the season of the Brewers, I guess, blue, blue and gold. So uh, it's great to be here. I remember, it was great for me to be here with the high school because I remember coming here as a high schooler. I won't tell you how long ago that is. You could maybe ask Ryan Gartman or Paul Minting or Wayne Sather since I went to school with his uh, kids. Um, you can figure out how long ago that was. But uh, it was great being here back then. I was scared out of my mind talking when I was in high school. But uh, So if you guys were a little nervous, I can definitely appreciate that. But thank you. Thank you, Scott, for setting this up. Thank you, Rotary, for what you do. Um, I was a member of the Usper Kiwanis Club, and unfortunately it folded in this last year because I was the youngest member, and most of the members were north of 70 years old, and we couldn't find anybody to... Uh, to run the organization anymore, so it was too bad that the Usper Kiwanis Club folded. But, you know, services like yours are so vital to the community, so thank you for what you do to, to the, for the community. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in, in Sheboygan County, like I said, with Paul and, and Ryan, and uh, went away to go to college, have degrees in business administration, political science, uh, moved back in 2002 to run my dad's business, which I subsequently bought, the Lakeshore Weekly. Look at it in Newsburg, a weekly shopper, a small print shop. I think it's important to have people in Madison who understand the, the struggles that small businesses face, people who have to pay those taxes, people who are writing payroll checks to their employees, people who are dealing with the, the work environment that, that we're dealing with here in Wisconsin. Um, I've also served nine years as a Sheboygan County board member. It was great working with uh, Adam Payne, Tom Wagner, those folks. Uh, I think we had a very successful run. Well, they're still doing a great job, but very successful when I was there. We reduced taxes for the nine years, uh, very fiscally responsible while investing in core priorities that our, our residents in Sheboygan County expect. Uh, four years ago, I was elected to the state Senate. Um, it's been a great four years. Um, when you go into public service, you think you have ideas of what you're gonna work on. But the great thing is you get to go tour businesses, meet with groups like this, meet with chambers, talk to superintendents like Tom used to be, and they give you ideas of what you need to start working on. So over the last four years, I actually had 33 bills that I authored, signed into law. Uh, 28 of those bills have bipartisan support. So I'm very proud of that track record. I'll just highlight a couple of the bills. Um, one, allows people to register to vote online if they have a valid ID card. Uh, this makes it easier so you don't have to deal with same day registration. We still have same day registration so people can, with a valid ID, go and, and state ID, go register same day. But it also uses technology to clean up our voter rolls to make sure people aren't registered in multiple areas. When people pass away to make sure that they're taken off the voter rolls, things like that. And the other bill I'm gonna highlight is the RAINS Act, which is the first in the nation legislation which brings legislative oversight to the rulemaking process. Sounds pretty exciting, huh? Um, but it is. Um, it brings a legislative check to the executive branch. The executive branch oversees all the agencies, like the DNR, Department of Transportation, things like that. And when these agencies promulgate rules, once they're promulgated, they have the force of law. And under previous law, we had no ability to stop this unless we passed a law overriding it. Well, then if we pass a law, then obviously the governor is going to veto it because it's his agency is promulgating these rules, so we would need a two-thirds veto-proof majority to stop rules from taking effect. So you send us to Madison to be your voice. It gives us that check on the executive branch. So that was very important. I'm very proud of that bill. 
Um, but things are going great in Wisconsin right now. I'm excited about the direction of Wisconsin right now. We have eight straight months of record low unemployment, 3% or less. There's a record number of people employed in Wisconsin. Every time I tour a business, they're like, I could hire 20 people today if we had more people. The economy is going great. Now, obviously, I have, even in my district alone, the three counties I represent, there are 5,500 more people working today than there were four years ago. Just think about that. 5,500 more people working today than there were four years ago. Things are exciting. Now, obviously, I can't take all credit for that. Um, I'd like to, but I can't. And we have a great uh, workforce in Wisconsin, educated, hardworking, dedicated. We have great family-owned businesses in Wisconsin that want to expand and grow in this area. And we have great schools in, in this area, fantastic schools in this area. So those are helping our state grow. But at the state government, what we do is we provide an environment to foster that job growth. And I think we've done a great job over the last four years holding the line on taxes, regulatory reform, red tape reform, to make sure that businesses have that certainty moving forward. We've, the two budgets that I voted on had the two lowest amounts of borrowing in the last 20 years. Just think of that. I know people don't trump at this enough, you know, it's not <coughs> sexy talking about, about debt burden, but that's not inflation adjusted. We had the two lowest amounts of borrowing over the last 20 years. Our bond rating was upgraded. We're making progress. We made historic investments in public schools over the last budget. Right now, schools are getting 10% more from the state than they were 10 years ago. 10% more from the state than they were 10 years ago. It's hard to get that news out of the media because it's not always covered. And we made significant investment in local road aids to help cities and municipalities and townships and counties improve on their roads. So with that, with all these great successes that we've seen in Wisconsin over the last uh, four years, eight years, brings on new challenges. What we need to focus on moving forward is workforce development, making sure we get the people that we need to fill the jobs and the skills and the training required. So that's what I plan on focusing on in the next four years is to make sure we're investing in our schools so they have things like fab labs so they can learn that skilled trade, working with tech colleges, with Paul, to make sure that they're providing the opportunity to get kids involved, expanding youth apprenticeship programs to partner businesses with the high schools, making sure there's broadband grants available like we've increased over the last four years to make sure there's internet capacity available all over the state of Wisconsin. Welfare reform to make sure those who are dependent on government can get the skills training they need, the help that they need to get back into the workforce. And um, the other issue that I think uh, that we really need to deal with going forward, which has sort of been an under-reported um, um, challenge that Wisconsin is facing, I think we've done a great job in the last four years trying to deal with the opioid epidemic. There's still work to be done, but through the whole hope agenda, you know, treatment and addiction, um, courts, things like that, we're making great progress. But the one area that we're sort of falling by the wayside on is mental health services. We have a great shortage of mental health services in the state of Wisconsin. I did pass a bill to give, uh, especially smaller schools, the opportunity to contract out and provide that so they can get the kids the help that they need in the schools. But even if they're trying to contract out, it's so hard to find those services in the, in the area. So I think that's one thing we need to focus on because you know, drug addiction, things like that, it's often tied with mental health issues and we need to make sure that those who have these challenges get the help that they need. So those are the two areas that I work, uh, look forward to uh, focusing on um, over the next four years. Um, as well as keeping Wisconsin moving in the, in the track that we're going right now to make sure that we're being responsible, fiscally responsible with your money, using it as best as, as we can possibly. So once again, thank you for inviting me. It has definitely been an honor and a privilege to serve you all over the last four years, to meet a lot of you in, in the room that I've gotten to know better over the last four years, and I look forward to uh, spending another four years uh, serving you here. Thank you. Just a yes or no question, please. I asked this last week of the two that were here talking to us. Uh, sanctuary status for the state of Wisconsin or for any municipality in the state, would you be in support of that or would you be opposed to it? 
I think it's an issue of local control, and locally elected officials should be decided to make sense what makes they can do in their communities. So, so you uh, would be in support of it at the local level? I believe that locally elected officials should be allowed to make that decision, and it's immigration is a federal issue, and I don't really think that locally units of government should be involved in enforcing federal laws like that, but um, that's a decision for local units of government to make. No. <laughs> Yes, sure. Did I have a question about broadband, especially yeah. you know, I'm glad you brought that up in your speech. Where I live in rural Elkhart Lake, there's no competition. I've got the choice of one. I, I pay for three accounts. I have a small business. And it's embarrassing when my clients want to access high speed internet from where I live. And, and I can't get higher than 10 megabytes a second. And it's way too expensive. So, what are your thoughts for bringing fast, speedy, affordable broadband? Yeah, it definitely is. That's why we, her question was referring to broad, broadband grants, which I brought up during during my talk, and that in Elkhart Lake, uh, their internet service isn't very good, and they only have one provider, and it's very expensive. And slow. And slow. And um, no, that's that's one thing we've actually focused on over the last four years, is expanding grants to, to local telecommunication companies, so that this could be expanded across Wisconsin. There are some challenges in this part of the state, but it's especially challenging all around the state, especially in the more rural, rural northern parts of the state of Wisconsin. So that's definitely important. It's an it's a economic driver. It's a job driver. I'm actually chairman of the uh, Utilities and Election Committee, so I, I oversee some of those bills that have gone through. So I was excited that we could get that help, and we need to make, keep making those investments going forward. Uh, the state should be investing in per making sure that we've got broadband access in every community. 23% of rural communities in Wisconsin do not have access to broadband. It's an economic issue, it's an education issue, right? In the school district, we've got one-to-one -one devices for all of our students that so they can do homework at home and get on the internet. Um, you get down to some rural communities and they're kids that are driving into public libraries and sitting in the parking lot just so they can use Wi-Fi. Um, if we want our students to succeed and to have a, a world-class workforce and a, you know economic engine driving forward, Internet access is a fundamental piece of that in the future. Um, we have to be investing in it as a state. Yes, I hear uh, Mr. Welton saying that uh, education needs more attention. I understand it's more funding. Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, Mr. Lemmick seems to suggest that there have been additional funds gone to education. Is it a question of just the amount that uh, should be devoted to that? And if it should be a higher amount, where would those funds come from? Would they be additional taxes or would they be a reallocation of uh, uh, other assets? The question was about education spending and <clears throat> is it just how much are we spending there or there are a couple other pieces to this. Um, uh, Deb and I are both in agreement that we need to reform the school funding formula in Wisconsin. Um, right now, we've got a funding formula that exacerbates inequities rather than really equalizing. Um, I think we have to make sure that we're accounting for, um, to get the, the term here correct, uh, free and reduced lunch levels and poverty in that, that formula, which we currently don't do. Uh, but one is reforming the school funding formula. The second piece is that, yeah, we do need more resources. Um, and it's not just a matter of throwing money at it, it's a matter of throwing more teachers, more social workers, more school therapists and, and, uh, at, at the issues we're dealing with. As we talked about mental health is a crisis in our schools. The rates are staggering. 13% of students before they reach eighth grade show symptoms of a diagnosable mental disorder. It gets to one in five when you're, before you graduate high school, and it's one in four in college. Um, we gotta have the resources to address that in the school system and make sure that our teachers are ready to deal with that because they can't be social workers, psychologists, and educators. Um, the other piece is that we need that for continual investment in the infrastructure in our schools. We had to do a $27 million referendum here in the Sheboygan Area School District because um, we got behind on maintenance after cutbacks. Um, the funding that came in the last budget was desperately needed, but it didn't replace the nearly one over $1 billion we lost from K-12 education. We also haven't even touched on higher education here. We've lost over a billion dollars over the last decade in higher education funding at the state, and every dollar you put in the UW system puts 24 back in the economy. Think about that, folks. 
has $24 billion <coughs> pulled out of Wisconsin's economy in development and research and, and other investment. So we do need more resources so that we have more staff, because um, right now teachers are on average paid less than they have at any point in Wisconsin's history. They're more inexperienced and morale is low. People, one in five new teachers leaves the profession in their first five years. And the enrollment in teacher preparation courses in Wisconsin is down 28%. We can't just lower licensing standards and expect that we're gonna have the same quality education. We have gotta be investing in attracting talent just as you do in your businesses. Mr. Alden did get one thing right. We do need to fix the school funding formula. That is by far the biggest inequity in the state of Wisconsin, especially in this part of the state. Um, we, in the, in the budget, I worked on an amendment with a lot of the local legislators to make sure that Schools that were capped at lower limits were given the flexibility to increase that. Um, we changed what the governor had in the budget because he had sparsity aid put in the budget for more rural uh, districts. He vetoed that out of there. Um, so we worked with the governor to get sparsity aid for rural districts. Like I have a couple in Reedsville, um, that part of the, the, the uh, Senate district. But to also help those school districts that are capped at low revenue limits, which are about half the school districts that comprise my Senate district, Random Lake, Boosburg, Sheboygan Falls, Keel, Plymouth, Manitowoc. So I, I was fighting for our school districts to make sure they could compete. I suppose I should look at the guy who asked the question, not, no, not over there. But, uh, but no, we have made great strides um, over the last four years in the budget. And uh, yeah. One of the largest economic fields happening in the state of Wisconsin is Foxconn. And one of our gubernatorial candidates who's running is suggesting that if he's elected, that he would open up the contract that we have with Foxconn and do some renegotiating. If you're, if you're elected or re-elected, would you support that? Well, I voted for the Foxconn deal. Um, being elected, and uh, I think it's a, it's a great investment in the state of Wisconsin. I know those who oppose it like to say it's a giveaway to a foreign corporation. No, Foxconn is now a Wisconsin company. They're based here in Wisconsin. They already have over 100 employees here in Wisconsin. These are great paying jobs, all the way from Racine to Milwaukee to Green Bay to Eau Claire to Madison. They're hiring great paying jobs. I was talking to Paul at the table. He's like, we've seen business exploding even though we're not actually working for Foxconn but businesses that are working with Foxconn. Just imagine 13,000 more jobs added to the state of Wisconsin. That's just the ripple effects of that is tremendous. It's hard to imagine, it's hard to understate how huge this is going to be for Wisconsin. Not just the construction stage but going forward and what I hear characterized as a 4.5 billion dollar giveaway it just frustrates me because these are credits are given out as the company is growing, investing in Wisconsin, and to uh, to try shortchange the incredible opportunity that this is for Wisconsin is uh, it just baffles me. So I would support that, and what I'll tell you is that I opposed the Foxconn was deal when it was proposed. Um, I hope that it's successful because if it is successful, the whole state succeeds. But I don't think this was a good deal for us and I don't think it was a good deal for businesses in this area. And I, I'll tell you why, is because it's just not fair. Madison shouldn't be in the game of picking winners and losers, right? Um, when local companies in this area were looking to expand, they weren't promised refundable tax credits for jobs that they provided. Um, the EPA didn't just all of a sudden waive our ozone issues that we were having um, for recent development. but that happened when some politicians in Madison were looking to score additional points before an election. Uh, that four and a half billion dollars that we promised to Foxconn, what's interesting is that instead of putting that into this company, you could have taken that money and given $300,000 to 100 entrepreneurs in every single county, all 72, and you still have more than $2 billion left to invest in roads and schools. Um, I'd rather be investing in Wisconsin entrepreneurs, building small businesses, investing in Main Street economy, um, allowing people to grow and thrive, right? 
when I sat down with some folks at Jake's Cafe and said, what's your number one obstacle from starting a new business? What is, what's troubling you? What keeps you from doing that? They said, well, I can't leave my current job to lose my health insurance. Health insurance cost in the market right now is just crazy high. Why wouldn't we take funds and allocate it in and allow for entrepreneurs either to buy Badger Care or be covered by it for five years as they're looking to start their new business? There's a lot of opportunities that we have in here that would allow for new business growth rather than trying to fish in a foreign corporation to build a factory that may be obsolete in a decade. We don't know. And at the best projections, this would pay off in 25 years. It may not even pay off in 50. Um, I don't think that this is worth it in your ta tax dollars. The other piece is that we're adding 13,000 jobs, but we've got historically low unemployment. This is a solution seeking a problem, right? Um, Wisconsin's not unemployed, we're underemployed. The issue is, is that we've got wage stagnation. They're starting to pick up, but it hasn't grown fast enough. So adding 13,000 jobs that are gonna be mostly at the median wage isn't helping the wage competition. I just wanna quickly respond to that just for a second. Um, when Kyle said he doesn't think the state should be picking winners and losers, that's what Sheboygan County Economic Development Corporation does. We have their member here. They help companies expand, companies who are growing. That's what WEDC does. In 2017, there were fifth, of the top 50 grants awarded by WEDC, five of them were in the Senate District. Johnsonville, Millport Sigma, Ameriquip, I'm forgetting Dalco, there was one more. These are companies that are expanding in our area. They're paying, the state is helping them create jobs which has a ripple effect around the community. So in the absence of competition with other areas of the country, yes, I would definitely be a free market guy, not picking winners and losers, but we're competing to keep our businesses here, to help them grow, because it's gonna help all businesses surrounding the community. My question is about the rapid increase in uh, prescription drug prices. Um, I've heard in the last month a number of stories from family and friends about the cost of their prescription medication just going through the roof. Um, I guess I'm wondering from the state standpoint, what can be done to bring that under control, reduce costs of prescription drugs? Well, in Wisconsin, we still have senior care, which gives reduced rates to those who are retired and getting prescription drugs. Now, that's definitely a concern. Uh, we need to make sure that we continue to help out those who are struggling with health issues. Um, uh, a lot of this is under the purview of the federal government, but uh, I, I'm also a member of the health committee and neither party introduced a bill over the last four sessions to try to drive down prescription drug costs. So I'd be looking look forward to any suggestions, ideas, and uh, see if we can implement them. Prescription costs are out of control, right? They continue to go up and it's price gouging our families. Um, I think in addition to senior care, we've also got Badger Script. We can actually add more money into those programs and, and provide more subsidies. If we took the federal Medicaid expansion, it would have saved us $380 million just in this biennium alone. It's cost us $1.6 billion or $1.06 billion as taxpayers over the time it's been available and the fact that we've rejected it. Um, so that additional revenue we could put directly into that program. I'd also be interested in seeing if we could put some regulatory authority in this and require companies that are going to increase drug prices in Wisconsin to disclose why they're doing it. A similar bill to this was introduced by John McCain and Senator Baldwin at the federal level. Um, the federal government won't act. I'd be interested to see if we could do that at the state. Time for one more question. Uh, you know, I'm not, obviously I run the local, or I'm with the local economic development organization here, and I'm not too worried about jobs and what's upcoming, because I see the demographic shifts. I know that 20 years in the future, we're likely to have even a greater workforce crunch. As a matter of fact, there's only two cities in the state of Wisconsin right now that are projected to actually, like, have their workforces increase because their number of high school graduates will all pace the retirees. That's Green Bay and that's Madison. Everyone else is going to be facing a worker shortfall. Um, the, the other interesting thing about this is what's happening, you talked about prescription drug prices. We know that in Sheboygan County alone, 
the number of senior citizens is going to increase by 70% over the next two decades. That means fewer people working and more people that in which half, if the, de if the federal data is correct, half of them don't have a penny saved for retirement, right? So now that's a lot of pressure not only on social services, nonprofits, but also on the families themselves trying to figure out how to support someone who is, is no longer working at some point, they're not going to be able to work. So what, I mean, any thoughts long term on the demographic challenges of Wisconsin in general? Because this is going to be coming, and it's going to be my generation probably bearing the brunt of this one way or another, um, whether it's privately or publicly. Any thoughts on what's about to happen with the silver tsunami and how the state may or may not want to react to that reality that's coming? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dean, yes, that's the answer. Don't retire anybody. Yeah, thank you. This is the looming crisis for all of us to think about, right? Is that we don't have enough workers to support the number of retirees that we have in our, our current system. Um, birth rates are, are going down, and people are wondering why my generation isn't having kids. It's because they can't afford it, right? Um, we've got a mortgage worth of student debt, and then uh, the jobs that we're entering in are often forty, fifty thousand dollars a year. To try to raise a family on that when you pay a mortgage and all of your student loans. Um, I think one thing that we can do is direct addressing that young professional group is allow them to refinance their student loans um, and help address that, that student debt burden. It's one of the areas that you can't refinance. Um, I guess you could go get a private loan, but then you lose all the protections that you've got at the, as a government borrower, and that just isn't acceptable when you're thinking about starting a family. Um, I think we've got to be working on making Wisconsin a place that attracts younger workers, right? What we know is that folks my age want public transit systems. They don't want to drive. They want to walk to work. They want to be able to have uh, the ability to hop on the bus, get to work, come back, and not worry about that. We haven't invested in those systems in Wisconsin. In fact, we, we kicked away a lot of that development earlier on. Um, we've got to be thinking about building an economy of tomorrow rather than keeping up track with yesterday. Um, so I don't have a perfect answer to this, and I don't think anybody in public office or seeking public office has a perfect answer to this because it's the looming challenge that we're not even sure exactly what it looks like as it, as it plays out, because there's a retirement aspect to it, as you said, people don't have any money saved up, um, but also how do we keep the workers in place. But it starts by making sure that you can actually start and raise a family, um, and second, that you're a place where people in my generation actually want to live, work, and thrive. That is a great question. If I was running for Congress, I'd tell you that we need to secure our borders, but then increase immigration, because there's people who want to come to this land of freedom, this great country that we live in. So if, if I was running for Congress, that would be my solution. But since I am a state senator, um, I can't control federal immigration law, unfortunately. But what we need to do um, is keep having a growing economy. Because when people move to Sheboygan to get, find a job with a growing company, they bring their family with them. They bring their spouse who's going to work. Hopefully they have children who grow up in the community and stay here. When Foxconn starts <coughs> recruiting people out of Illinois, they're going to move up to Wisconsin. They're going to bring their spouses. They're going to bring their kids. And it's going to have a magnetic effect. That's what's happening in Madison with Epic, a growing company with a huge campus. That's what's going to happen down in these whole technology areas that Foxconn is creating in Green Bay and Eau Claire and around the state. But the best way to attract people is to have great paying jobs so people want to come here. We have great resources in Wisconsin. We need to make sure we're protecting those resources, but fantastic lakes, vacationing up north, hunting, um, snow. We get four seasons up here. It's exciting. So um, I think Wisconsin's a fantastic place to live, and hopefully we can get that message out there. Yeah. 